All my brothers and sisters in Christ, as always, I ask you to praise the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I always want to greet you with uh, the sense of uplifting your souls uh, to make us aware that uh, we are here to do God's business, as it were. We're here to sing praises to our great God. And uh, so this morning, I want you to be aware of that. I want your hearts to be lifted up, uh, not so much in a, in, a, in a merely emotional way, but spiritually. I want your gaze to be heavenward. I want your affections to be on Christ. And so when I say every Lord's Day morning, praise the Lord, I mean it. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's take our Bibles and turn to uh, Matthew, back to Matthew, I'm sorry, back to Mark, the 12th chapter. Of uh, What we're going to do this morning is we're going to uh, revisit the passage of Scripture that we looked at last week. And you might remember that that was that passage of scripture there in uh, Mark uh, chapter 12, uh, I believe it was verses uh, 35 through 40, where our Lord Jesus Christ engaged um, the scribes and he really brought them the task for their failure essentially to see him in all of scripture. You remember last week we used that phrase, we repeated that phrase, how that all of Scripture coalesces around and culminates in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the great failure by way of the religious leaders was their failure to see Christ in the Scriptures. Uh, he, he took them the task for this. Uh, they knew the Scripture. They were willing to go so far with Scripture. They could see very clearly that Messiah was to be David's son, but they could not answer the question, how then is David's son David's Lord? And the reason why they failed to understand that or failed to answer that question is either by way of incompetence or by way of hatred. Their incompetence would have been seen in the fact that they were unable to see the very centerpiece of Scripture, which is Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39. The Scriptures testify of Jesus Christ. And so it may have been incompetence on their part, or it may have been outright hostility on their part. And then after that, our Lord Jesus Christ, you remember, <clears throat> he goes on to condemn them for their motives. Now, their motives were all bound up in their love of praise, their love of position, their love of uh, uh, having the pride of place. And so our Lord dealt with them in a, in a very severe way. Yeah, you might also remember that we said that Mark chapter 12 is parallel of uh, Matthew chapter 23, where we really see the extended account of our Lord's condemnation of the scribes and the Pharisees. You also might remember that what I said last week was that that passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 40, was a very, very, uh, if I can coin a new phrase here, new in the sense that I didn't use it last week, it was a very theologically dense passage of Scripture. And what I meant by that, and what I mean by that is this, is that there is much by way of substance in that passage of Scripture where a number of chief theological heads are presented to us in the passage. You remember we saw when our Lord Jesus Christ asked the question, how was it that David, speaking by the Spirit, said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Again, David speaking by the Spirit. Remember we said last week the doctrine of inspiration. We took a look as well, uh, uh, or we made reference as well to the idea of, uh, of uh, Psalm 110, uh, the, one of the great Christological psalms of the Old Testament. Uh, the most quoted uh, passage of the Old Testament and the New Testament is Psalm 110. And so again, this passage of Scripture not only centers in our doctrine of Scripture, it also centers in our doctrine of the person of Christ. Very, very important. And then you remember how we said that uh, uh, our, our third major category was the, was the category of uh, eternal judgment, <coughs> excuse me, or condemnation. And I said last week that what I would do in the weeks to come would be to unpack, to some extent, each of those doctrinal categories. And I want to do that beginning today. Now what I want to do is I want to touch on the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture. Much to be said about this beautiful doctrine, this necessary doctrine, this essential doctrine. As a matter of fact, I would say to you um, that your view of Scripture determines in a very real way what your Christian life is going to look like. If you have a very low view of Scripture, your Christian life is going to look somewhat different than what it ought to look like. So some of the things I'm going to say this morning might be somewhat challenging. It's not my intention, however, this morning to, to challenge as much as it is to establish, to establish this doctrine and then to hopefully encourage uh, to, uh, to, to embrace a view of Scripture that is parallel to that of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what we said last week? We are poor Christians indeed uh, if we do not have or embrace the same view of Scripture that our Lord Jesus Christ embraced. Stop and think of this. 
for those who would take a view of Scripture uh, somewhat lower than what our Lord embraced. This Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, come into, in, into, uh, into time and space by way of incarnation, who lives and dies in fulfillment of the Scriptures, who, who, who moves in his entire life with this responsibility to fulfill the Scriptures, as I said before, who bleeds and dies and rises again from the dead, for our behalf, we will have a view of Scripture lower than His. <clears throat> we will engage Scripture in a way that does not come up to His view of Scripture. As I said before, poor Christians indeed, if that's the case. And so what I hope to do this morning is to open up this wonderful doctrine of the inspiration of Holy Scripture. And we're going to take a look then at uh, Mark chapter 12. I'm just going to read the one verse. Actually, let me read verses 35 through 40 again just to set the, the context. And we're, we're going to come back to verse 36 and then open up the passage. <clears throat> Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. And we read the following. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David, therefore, calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplace, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at the feast, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. <clears throat> Let us pray. Our Father and our God. We come to you this morning in the name of your Son and our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come, Lord God, by way of purposeful prayer, asking that you would enable and cause the very, your very Spirit who inspired Scripture to open our eyes that we might see Christ from Scripture. Give us grace in this, we pray. Help us particularly as we look to what we, from our human perspective, refer to as the doctrine of Holy Scripture. Give us grace, we pray, Lord God, to love and to embrace this, your God-breathed word. Grant these things to us, we pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bear with me as I read my introduction here this morning. The first theological book that I was ever given is a classic text on the doctrine of Holy Scripture. It was by B. B. It was B. B. Warfield or Benjamin Warfield's work on the inspiration and authority of the Bible, and it was given to me by, by my first pastor, Pastor Jerry Maria. Benjamin Warfield wrote this book, or rather, a series of articles that became the book in the late 19th century, and it remains a classic today. In fact, no treatment of the subject since that time has been able to engage the doctrine of Holy Scripture without some reference to Warfield. This subject of Holy Scripture of the Holy Scripture's inspiration, I'm sorry, this subject of the Holy Spirit's inspiration of the Bible is so important that it is not an exaggeration to say, tell me what a man thinks of the Bible and its inspiration by the Holy Spirit, and I can tell you whether he will live his life according to the Word of God or according to some type of authority other than Scripture. Oh, it may be informed by Scripture, it may speak of respect of Scripture. But the authority of Scripture will be, will be a secondary issue when push comes to shove. This is why throughout this series of uh, sermons on uh, Scripture that we've been doing, that we've been conducting, particularly in our evening ser uh, uh, services, this is why throughout this series we have been going th uh, through, and we have really attempted to place in our minds that thought that Jesus' view of the Bible should be our view of the Bible. We want to consciously frame our minds with this thought. Whatever Jesus believed about the Bible is what I am committed to believe and what I pray God will give me the grace to believe. Why should I pray that God will give me the grace to believe what seems to be so obvious? The answer is because the Word of God has been and always will be the focus of Satan's, attempt, uh, of, of Satan's attacks. His opening salvo in the long war to turn man against God was to ask the question, Hath? God said. When tempting our Lord, it was with a twisting of Scripture in order to have Jesus act against Scripture. This is why our Lord answered every wrong use of Scripture by Satan with a true and proper use of Scripture. 
When men make wrong use of scripture, they do so to the destruction of their own souls. And therefore, we must pray that God would give us grace to embrace the word of God and to embrace it in the way that our Lord Jesus did. Tell me, what your favorite tell me what your favorite teacher or preacher or writer believes about Holy Scripture, and I'll tell you whether or not he is worth following. Again, coming back to the text that we considered last week, those who do not see Christ in the Scripture or preach Christ from the Scripture are not worthy guides to be followed. <clears throat> One man says this about Jesus' view of Scripture. This is a quotation from J.I. Packer. He says the following, he says, There is no lack of evidence from our Lord's attitude to the Old Testament. He prefaces it with the regular formula, formula of solemn assertion, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and the following emphatic assertion, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot tittle, or not one jot or tittle shall in any ways, in any way pass from the law. And so again, we have this, we have this reality of our Lord expresses in Scripture a particular view of the Bible itself. The Scripture presents a view of Scripture. Jesus presents to us a view of Scripture. And we, again, as the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, should and ought and must embrace that same view that our Lord sets before us. And so what I want to do, <clears throat> as is obvious from this introduction, I want to set before you, I can't really say it's going to be a formal study on the doctrine of Scripture. I do want this to be a sermon more than a lecture, uh, but there are going to be elements of this that will be more of a lecture than a sermon. But I hope to give it some sermonic form here this morning. And so what I want to do is I want to begin with a definition of what is meant by this doctrine of the inspiration of Holy Scripture. What is meant by inspiration? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief, what I would call working definition. And then, I'm going, then I'm going to expand on that definition by way of some authorities in this field. And so the first thing that I would set before you would be this very brief and working definition of inspiration. What do we mean by inspiration? Inspiration, then, is that action of the Holy Spirit directing the writers of Scripture through His personal superintendence to speak and to write the things revealed, to go, revealed by God. <clears throat> Again, it is the action of the Holy Spirit directing the writers of Scripture through his personal superintendence to speak and to write the things revealed by God. Let's go back just a moment. Let's go back and look at verse 36 of, of Mark chapter 12 once again. Notice what our Lord says. How is it... Let me get the text here in front of me. Notice what, what our Lord says. <clears throat> For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit. Or David himself said, by the Holy Ghost. Do you understand? Do you see that? David speaks, but it's by the Holy Ghost. Now listen to this little definition that I've tried to formulate. The action of the Holy Spirit directing the writers of Scripture through his personal superintendence to speak and to write the things revealed by God. David, by the Holy Ghost. It was David speaking. David was the instrument of the original author who was God revealing to man by way of the work of the Spirit what was to be said. So this working definition, this very simple kind of thumbnail uh, definition of inspiration, I want you to keep with you, but I want to give you, you know, more authoritative uh, voices in this regard. Along with the brief definition that I, that I just gave, I would also say this, that inspiration, and this becomes important when we get into some of the, some of the technical matters that surround inspiration. Let me say this. As with every a doctrine of Holy Scripture, every pivotal doctrine of Holy Scripture, uh, it, is a, it is a doctrine that, uh, that, is, uh, that faces uh, uh, opposition and controversy. Uh, the, the, the church has had to fight and defend this doctrine of Holy Scripture. It's, it's not something that goes without being challenged. Yea, hath God said. It occurs over and over again in, in many ways. And so in, 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 uh, in the defense of this doctrine, this next caveat has to be added to that simple definition that I gave. Inspiration deals with the thought and words and those thoughts and words being written down. So in other words, inspiration deals with both the thinking, the mind, and the very words. Sometimes it's said that inspiration just, uh, just, pertains, to, uh, just pertains to the thoughts, and it was left for the men, for, 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 the, for the writers, to, in a fallible way, uh, write down. And we say no to that, both the, both the thought and the words. 
are under the superintendence of the Spirit of God. But not only the thoughts and the words, also the writing itself is under the superintendence of the Spirit of God. And so that would be the caveat that I would add to that. Let me give you, as I said before, more authoritative voices. Uh, a, um, an influential theologian of about maybe 50 to 60 years ago, a gentleman by the name of uh, Carl F. Henry, some of you might be familiar with him, uh, he wrote, uh, I think it's a six-volume work on uh, God, Revelation, and Authority. He deals with this. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, probably, uh, it's probably an underused uh, uh, work, but it's a very valuable work. Uh, Carl Henry writes the following. He says this, Inspiration is a supernatural influence upon divinely chosen prophets and apostles, whereby the Spirit of God assures the truth and trustworthiness of their oral and written proclamation. You see both the words and the writing. Historical evangelical Christianity considers the Bible as the essential textbook because in view of this quality of the inspiration, it, inscriptur it inscripturates divinely revealed truth in verbal form. And so what Carl Henry is saying, he's giving something of a definition of, uh, of inspiration here. He's talking about the activity of the Spirit of God. He's talking about how that activity involves uh, not only the, uh, the words, but also the writing. But he's also saying by way of the effect of that is that the church historically has seen in the Scripture that source of authority because it has, uh, it, it has connected to it the idea, the truth, that God is its author. <clears throat> so that was Carl Henry. <clears throat> Excuse me this morning. Another man of, uh, of uh, probably maybe 175 years ago uh, now, a man, um, uh, Alexander Hodge, uh, he uh, was the son of the famous uh, Princeton theologian Charles Hodge. Uh, he wrote the following. He says, inspiration is that divine influence. Notice again how we keep seeing this emphasis on the work of the Spirit. It, it's, a, it's a divine activity. That's how I said it earlier. It was a divine activity. Hodge is bringing up the same thing. Inspiration is that divine influence which accompany, accompanying the sacred writers equally in all that they wrote secured the infallible truth of their writings in every part, both in idea and expression, thoughts and words, and, uh, and determined the selection and distribution of their material, material according to the divine purpose. Now, I, I do like what, what Hodge brings to our attention here because this is something that, that, is, uh, that comes up in these, in these discussions about inspiration. Notice what Hodge says. He says, The nature of this influence, just as the nature of the divine operation upon the human soul in providence, regeneration, and sanctification, is, of course, entirely inscrutable. In other words, he's saying, there's something of a mystery here when we try to exactly flesh out how inspiration took place. I mean, how inspiration took place. What was it that happened? Did the, did the writers of Scripture, did they act as stenographers? Were they, were they, was, there, was there, you know, sometimes this, uh, this, is, this, this phrase is said in a, in a derogatory manner. What, was, it, was, it, was it mechanical dictation? Uh, was there no use of the personal faculties and intellect of the, uh, of the writers? And of course, the, 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 the biblical and evangelical view is, no, these men were not automatons. Uh, they were not just writing mechanically. Uh, God was making use of all their faculties. God was making use of the providential ordering uh, of their particular lives to make them the persons that they were, to bring through them, through their instrumentality, the very thing that God wanted revealed and, and, and made known. And so when, when, uh, when Hodge says that there is something of an inscrutable nature or an inscrutable element uh, about, uh, about, uh, about inspiration, we would have to say we can understand why he's saying that, but, but what we drop back to, we don't, we don't camp out in inscrutability, we drop back to the simple statement of Scripture, David spoke by the Spirit. Or, or, or the Spirit spoke you know, through David. And that, it's that idea that whatever else is going on, we have the superintendence of the Spirit of God upon the person and personality of the writer to reveal what God intended to reveal. Beyond that, it may be difficult to say exactly what happened, but we know at least that. And so again, this is the thing that we see here. Now, um, uh, 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 a document that's not all that old as far as theological documents go, uh, the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. In, uh, in its sixth article, 
defines the inspiration of Scripture with these words. And again, it makes a case for what is known not merely as inspiration, but it makes a case for what is known as verbal plenary inspiration. What is verbal plenary inspiration? Verbal refers to the words of Scripture, not just the ideas, the ideas and the words verbal Plenary, meaning throughout the extent, the fullness, every word of Scripture is inspired by God. So verbal plenary inspiration. And again, this, this sixth article uh, is as follows. Ver, uh, the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. We affirm that the whole of Scripture in all of its parts, plenary, down to the very words, verbal, of the original were given by divine inspiration. We deny that the inspiration of Scripture can rightly be affirmed with, uh, uh, can af I'm sorry, can, let me start it again. We deny that the inspiration of Scripture can rightly be affirmed of the whole without the parts, or of some of the parts, but not the whole. And with what they're saying there is this, they're, and by way of affirmation and denial, they want to be as clear as they can. And we're saying, look, we're saying that the, that the Scripture in all of its parts are, 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 are equally inspired. And, 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 and what we're not saying is that only some of the parts are inspired. In other words, what this statement is saying, what, I would, what I'm presenting here this morning is the same. That the, we're not saying that, uh, that the elements of, of history and science were not inspired, but passages like Romans 8 were inspired. Uh, passages like John 3.16 were inspired. But when it came to time to, to record history, there was no inspiration taking place there. This document is saying no to that. Say no, every part of the Bible is inspired by God. All scripture, Paul will say, is given by inspiration. And so that's what we mean by way of this, uh, by way of a definition of, uh, of, of inspiration. Let me go back again, if you don't mind, to that, very, to that little thumbnail sketch. And, and, and again, you know, in, in, in sermons like this or, in, or in, in, in times when I'm teaching, this is a very common way for me to proceed. I like to, I, I like to have something of a working definition, which will be shorter, and then something of a fuller technical definition, which again, because it's fuller and technical, it's going to be harder to, to, to remember. Uh, but that, that shorter definition is usually what I call like a working definition. In other words, if you don't understand, if you, if you, if you can't, Grasp everything else, grasp at least this. And let me go back to that definition. Inspiration, then, is, the, is that action of the Holy Spirit directing the writers of Scripture through his personal superintendence to speak and to write the things revealed by God. And the evidence for this we would give, again, verse 36, David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, again, in one sense, was the author, and David was the instrument. And so, again, this is what we mean by way of by way, of, uh, by way of inspiration. So let's consider the, uh, the, the, the biblical evidence for this. It's one thing to set out a definition. It's one thing to set out a proposition. Uh, but where do we see the evidence for this? Well, again, I would suggest that we just go back to, to Mark chapter 12, verse 36. I've, I've repeated it a number of times. David said by the Holy Spirit, this is inspiration. And it's very interesting. We made reference of this, uh, we made reference of this uh, last Lord's Day evening how many times the scripture speaks about David being an instrument of divine inspiration. Now, at least four times in scripture, David is referred to as the instrument of inspiration. And what's interesting is if we take the parallel passages in the gospel, you may have as many as six times where a, a, a clear reference to David writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is made reference to. Again, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 36, David said by the Spirit. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, those of you that were with us in our evening sermons, you heard this. David, said, uh, David says this in 2 Samuel 23, 2, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. This again, whatever we don't understand about inspiration, we, we affirm at, at least this. So in some way, there was a superintendence by the Spirit of God working in David, upon David, and through David so that David speaks the very words of God. And he does this with an awareness. We see the, the, the Apostle Paul will say uh, something along the same line, how he's aware that he's writing under the influence of the Spirit of God. And again, these things become unique to the biblical writers. We'll, we'll go on this in, 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 in a little bit. So Mark chapter 12, verse 36. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. And Acts chapter 1, verse 16. Men and brethren, 
the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake uh, b before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. What I want you to see is this. Notice how that this spirit-inspired scripture becomes the basis for the church's conduct and the basis for the church's decision-making. A decision had to be made. And what do they do? Do they just gather great minds around together? Like-minded? No. What do they do? They go to Scripture. Why? Because David spoke by the Spirit. It was an authoritative text for them. In Acts chapter 4, verse 25, it's the same thing. Now here we see the, uh, the church is coming out of a time of, a, of a, you know, a period, this period of, of, of opposition and persecution. And they begin to pray a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And so I want you to see something. Inspired scripture becomes the rule for their conduct as to what to do. Inspired scripture becomes the basis of their praying afterwards. Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Peter's praying, and then he says this in verse 25. <clears throat> Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. Why do the heathens rage and the people plot vain things? Again, Psalm 2. And so notice how we see, again, in, in at least four in at least four. Clear references. You have David as an instrument. You have the Spirit of God as, as superintending what God intend to re, intended to reveal. Another passage that brings out the work of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, being evident um, in the revelation of saving truth is found in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, not 2 Peter that we, that we looked at this morning. We will be going there, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Notice what Peter writes. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. The Spirit of Christ that was in them. And it's interesting how that we see these, uh, these prepositions used in connection with, the, with inspiration upon the instruments that the Spirit of God uses. It was David speaking by the Spirit. But here, here Peter says it was the Spirit of Christ in them. In 2 Peter, uh, uh, Peter will make reference how that the Spirit of God bore them along, carried them along. And so this is, again, as I said before, whatever else we, 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 we don't understand about the mystery of inspiration, how it took place, was there a verbal dictation? Well, in some cases, we know that there was. God says to the prophets, and I'm going to take, you know, take and write. In other cases, we, we don't see that. We see God making use of the full faculties of the men that he chose to write scripture. A very interesting way of presenting this is by, again, Benjamin Warfield. And he uses a kind of a neat picture. Kind of a, I, I really enjoy the picture, actually. He says it's not as though God had to search far and wide for somebody to write the right thing in Scripture. God didn't have to go on this great quest to find just the right man at the right time. He says, no, but rather God, much like the architect of the stained glass window, put together men providentially by way of nature, by way of gifts, by way of calling, by way of life circumstances, worked providentially in their lives so that when the light of revelation shone through, the blue was blue, the orange was orange, the yellow was yellow, and the very thing intended by the architect was now flooding the space. And it's the same way with Scripture. These men, unique men, were truly their own persons. And it was God, again, not suspending their personality or their character, but making use of their personality and character in the way that he has so providentially ordered to bring to bear in our possession now this which we can say is given to us by way of the work of the Spirit of God. And so, again, here, 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 1, uh, the Spirit of Christ that was in them. Now, the classic text for the doctrine of inspiration, uh, there are a number of them, but any work on inspiration is going to engage at least these three texts. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Rick read that this morning. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 21. Again, Rick read that this morning. And then John chapter 10, verse 35. That passage of scripture where Jesus says, the scriptures cannot be broken. We're going to look at each of these passages uh, here, uh, not, in a, not in a full way, but we will engage them to some, to some extent. <clears throat> so now, once we have the definition of the doctrine of, 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 of inspiration, 
uh, on, the, on, on the table, so to speak. Once we have those passages that show or prove out what inspiration looks like in actual practice, if I can say it that way, or as it comes to us, <clears throat> and as we see the, uh, uh, the repeated uh, uh, emphasis of Scripture, particularly through the person of David, we now have to ask ourselves the question, what are the effects of the Spirit's inspiration on Scripture, and why does it matter? What are the effects, and why does it matter? Well, the first effect that I want to convey to you, and this is my own particular order, so there may be a better ordering of this, but let me, let me present this to you. The first effect that we have of this Spirit-inspired Scripture, this revelation from God, the first effect that we have is that we know without fail the means and the way of salvation. And this is significant. Why do I say that? I will ask you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll look at verses 15 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. You might remember as you're turning there, you might recall that when Rick read that passage of Scripture, he started back in chapter, I'm sorry, in verse 10. And the reason why we started back in verse 10 was because I wanted you to see that uh, Paul was talking of a day that parallels our own. It was a day of increasing wickedness. It was a day of increasing darkness. It was a day of, 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 of men going the wrong way. And what did Paul say? Paul said this, hey, look, you, you know my suffering. You know my manner of life. You know how I live. And then he comes now to, to, to base everything that he's going to say on this, this, this God-breathed scripture that he talks about. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, we read this. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let me stop there just for a moment. Remember I talked last week and I made reference to it again this morning. How that all scripture coalesces around and culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. You have known the holy scriptures from a child. You've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise into salvation. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ. You see the scriptures point to Christ. And you know that you understand the scriptures when your faith centers on Christ. When your affections center on Christ. Paul goes on to say in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me just say a word here about this little phrase, uh, by inspiration of God. Now, the word inspiration, surprisingly, after having made all this emphasis on it this morning, occurs relatively rare in the scripture. This in one other place, uh, and, for, and forgive me for not having the other, uh, the other place where the word in our English occurs, inspiration. Forgive me for not having that. Let's see if I can just, you know, search my memory. I can't, I can't pull it up in my memory right now. Uh, it only occurs twice. <clears throat> and in this case, in this word, I mean, I'm sorry, in this, in this phrase here, the Greek word is, 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 it only occurs once in the scripture. The other time the word inspiration is used, it's used of a, it's translating another word. And this word inspiration a lot of times the you know our, our commentators and our theologians and our you know our wordsmiths so to speak they, they tell us that that this is not the best picture because when we think of inspiration we think of breathing into something and so the picture is sometimes presented that something was written and then God breathed into it a divine element we might say well that's really not what's being said in this passage of scripture R rather what's being said is essentially this that this idea of being God-breathed deals with the concept of Scripture's origin. And so as breath originates within and is exhaled, so Scripture originates in God. And so when we talk about a God-breathed revelation, we're talking about something that finds its origin in God himself. That's what gives Scripture the character that it has. That's why Peter will say in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 21, <clears throat> he says the following, For prophecy came in old time, not by the will of man. The newer translations, the ESV, says it something like this. No prophecy ever came by the will of man. No, 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 revel no true revelation of God ever came by the will of man. Scripture is not the product of religious genius. Scripture is not the product of a certain men, uh, again, possessed of, a, of unique uh, uh, qualities that are native to their own being. And from that produce great works, great religious literature. That's not what Scripture is. Scripture is breathed out from God. 
Its origin is not in man. Its origin is in God himself. This is the very, again, this is how this word is, 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 is understood, again, by way of our dictionaries and our, and our, and our, and our theologians. <clears throat> again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then, of course, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. We ask the question, what is the use? What's the effect of, of God-breathed scripture? Well, again, it makes you wise unto salvation. And can I say this? You never need to be in doubt as to how, how a soul is saved. You never have, need to have any doubt. God himself has told you how you're saved. God himself has told you in this passage of scripture. It's the scriptures culminating in faith in Jesus Christ. That's how a person is saved. Can I come back to the same thought over and over again and say to you that the church is a broken record? We have one message, and that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what we preach, and that's what we proclaim. <clears throat> and so again... You have, by way of this, by way of this God-inspired uh, uh, revelation, the scriptures we hold in our hand. You know the way of salvation, and I'm telling you that's worth something. I don't know why. You know, let me say this. I was reading this morning. <clears throat> if you allow me a personal note, I picked up a, a used set of Britannicas, and I was reading uh, something just in between things. I just it was on it was on social development. I was talking about uh, and under under social development, the uh, uh, the uh, the category of, uh, of of racism came up. And at the end of this article, the, the the culminating point on this article was that you know sometimes there are situations and circumstances where uh, if, uh, if you know if, uh, if 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 the aggrieved or or the those who are who are who are again uh, you know in the in, being uh, oppressed by by racial uh, tendencies or, or racial uh, policies, that the, the the that the recourse that was suggested by Britannica was that sometimes violence is necessary. And I'm thinking to myself, what kind of thing is that to say? What kind of what kind of a recommendation is that? What about this idea of reconciliation that we find in Scripture? You see, when man leaves off this, the, when man leaves off this divinely revealed revelation from God, he's left to his own devices. And his own devices will lead him where his own devices will always lead. And the sin and away from God. And so again, when we have this, this divine revelation in front of us, the word of God, you know the way of salvation that means something. So we thank God for, for Holy Scripture. But again, we see that there's more here in this passage of Scripture. There are four things listed that Scripture is profitable for. It's useful. These are the things that Scripture does. It's profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Doctrine, again, let me say this, doctrine isn't just, isn't just in, this, in this passage of Scripture what we would call academic categories. There are academic categories. There's no two ways about it. Again, uh, uh, the study of theology can be considered a science in some regards. Oh, but doctrine, again, is not just doctrine by way of these, these academic categories. Can I say it like this? It's, it's doctrine for living. It's doctrine for life. You remember the some of our some of our uh, uh, men who were who who were worth listening to in some of their radio programs. Remember G, D, uh, D. James Kennedy, Truth Should Transform. You remember uh, 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 what is Alistair Begg, uh, uh, Truth for Life. It isn't just it isn't just truth in the academic sense. It's truth for living. It's truth for bringing glory to God. And so again, Scripture is profitable for doctrine. Where do you get these truths to transform? You get them in the God-breathed scripture. That's where you get them. Where do you get these, these truths uh, that, are, uh, that, that, that are useful for life and godliness? In the word of God. So scripture is profitable for doctrine, for, rebu for reproof. And here is that reality of rebuking and correcting. Well, you see, this is the purpose of scripture. We can't be without it. Sometimes we hate to... Well, it depends on your nature, I think, sometimes. I think sometimes there are some people, they like rebuking people. That's, that's what they're all... Other times, some people hate about the, the, the rebuking. You know, they're, they're so, they're so uh, uh, backwards, uh, you know, so uh, reluctant to do it. But it's necessary. It's necessary. Uh, and, and, and isn't it a beautiful thing? There's, there's this wonderful symmetry here. You have doctrine, you have reproof, and then you have correction. Just because somebody is reproved, that doesn't mean that they're, that, that, that they're beyond hope. No, the Scripture gives correction. The scripture, again, shows the right way in opposition to the wrong way. And then instruction in, in, in righteousness, again, shows how the, how the God's view of things becomes the priority for all of our lives. And so, again, this passage of scripture, again, Paul goes on to say in verse 17, 
uh, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly equipped for, thoroughly equipped for, for, every, uh, for every circumstance. Now, that phrase, perfect, thoroughly equipped, is another of these interesting word pictures, so to speak. Um, those two expressions, perfect, thoroughly equipped, the, the, the first word perfect has the idea of, of competent, of sufficient, of able. There's, there's nothing by way of living out the Christian life that the scripture is not able to make you competent in. It's beautiful. Everything you need for life and godliness we see in scripture. Again, it was in, it was in the passage I believe that Rick read again this morning in the, in the beginning of, uh, of 2 Peter chapter 1. He's given us uh, uh, all things necessary for life and godliness. Uh, verse uh, 3 and 4 I believe it is there. In First Peter, Second Peter, one, uh, but but it, it doesn't stop there. It says perfect, thoroughly furnished. And what I love about this 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 picture, and I, I've only seen one uh, one like uh, lexicon or dictionary bring this out, but the picture is wonderful. Thoroughly furnished, everything necessary for the living of Christ, of the Christian life is found in the Scripture. Again, that one resource that I was referring to gives this picture. The, the word is used of a, of a sailing vessel being ready, getting ready to go on a long journey and everything needed for that journey is loaded onto the ship so that in the journey, nothing will be lacking. Oh, do you see what scripture is to you? Everything you need for life and for godliness is in the word of God. Why is it? Because it's divinely breathed out by God. Why is it? Because well, How does it come to us? Through the, uh, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God. How does it come in human form? Through the instrumentality of men. Oh, this doctrine of, 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 of the inspiration of Scripture, so valuable. So again, we, we see everything necessary for, for life and everything necessary for salvation in the Scripture. I want to watch my time here. I want to be careful. Uh, the next thing I want you to see is that it becomes, a, it, it becomes the, uh, uh, the, 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 the full authority in, in, in matters of theological controversy. And I don't want to get too carried away here, but again, I've mentioned a number of times John chapter 10, verse 35. Again, uh, the scripture cannot be broken. And if, let me see if I can just do this quickly. John 10 is a very interesting passage of scripture because once again, Jesus is engaged in something of controversy uh, with the religious leaders. And they are really, uh, they, are, they are coming after him because of his affirmation that he is the son of God, making himself equal with God. He's referring, and it's interesting that, that in that 10th chapter of John, I believe you have the word Christ and then, the, and, then, and then the son of God and then being equal with God. And this is where they take up stones to stone him. And he says, for what work do you stone me? And he said, not for a work because you, you, you said that you're the son of God making yourself equal with God. And what's interesting is this is our Lord, and sometimes we don't know how to process John 10. Because what our Lord does is he says, wait, he says, wait a minute. He says, if the scripture says ye are gods, remember the, the, the application there was that the term small g God was being referred to human judges and men in places of authority. And Jesus is saying, if you say that, if the, if the, if the scripture says, that judges are gods, and this is the point. And the scripture can't be broken. What's he saying? So, to us, it sounds like he's being evasive. He's not. He's saying to them, listen, don't take issue with the fact that I refer to myself as the son of God, the one whom God has sent, because you know yourself that the scripture, and the scripture cannot be broken, says that your human judges are small g gods. What's he arguing for? He's arguing for the unassailability, how the, the, the scripture cannot be assailed by way of its authority. So whatever the scripture says, that's the final authority. And so in, in times or places of religious controversy, this God-breathed scripture gives us the basis on which to proceed. You understand the point that I'm making? Again, that, 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 that passage in John chapter uh, 10 has to be looked at. It, it's, sometimes it's hard for us to, to get our minds around it because a number of things are going on. And sometimes we think that our Lord is just trying to be evasive there. He's not being evasive. What he's doing is he is, he is pressing against his, his accusers the authority of Scripture and then standing on what he says on the basis of the authority of Scripture. Scripture is unassailable for our Lord Jesus Christ. In these matters of religious controversy. And it must be the same with us. But moving on. Our walk in this world. 
and our Christian experience is to be directed by this Spirit-inspired inspired Bible. Now, I will ask you to take your Bibles and go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And as you're turning there, let me just say this about this passage in general. Um, it was a joy for me to preach from uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, a number of years back. Um, but as I look at this passage, I think to myself, oh, did I exhaust this passage? And I think, no, no you know, because one of the things that uh, I was doing by way of design was just keeping with the flow of the passage. We didn't stop to develop the doctrine within that was that's, that's embedded within the text. But what's embedded in this text of 2 Peter chapter 1 is this doctrine of Holy Scripture. It comes up over and over again. And I want you to see what Peter says here, beginning in verse 16. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And again, this is a reference to the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 17, For we he received from the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him on the holy mount. Now verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now again, I know the ESV, the newer translations, most of the newer translations say we have the word of prophecy made more sure. We're going to engage that in a minute. We have, we have uh, King James, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn, uh, uh, dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Get the flow here for a minute. Notice what Peter is saying. He is saying to this, to this group of, 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 we might even say, beleaguered uh, Christians who were suffering persecution. He's writing them to, to them from the perspective that soon he's going to be off the scene. And, and when, he, when he's off the scene, again, I, I said this, I remember saying this when I was preaching the passage. Peter doesn't establish a continuing office of the papacy. What Peter does instead is he, is, he gives scripture to become the source and the authority for everything that's going to be understood. And then from that, what he says is essentially this. Understand that in these days to come, you may not even have experiences like I had on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was a glorious experience, let me tell you. There was the voice of heaven. There was God saying, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. And some of the translations carry that forward but in this way. Now, therefore, because of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, the word of prophecy is even made more sure. It can be translated that way. It can also be translated in the sense that the King James is bringing out. That even over against this great and and wonderful religious experience of seeing Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and, and Elijah and the voice from heaven. I remember saying at the time that, that one, one, one commentator said, this is a beautiful picture of the church universal. There's God the Father speaking and drawing attention to his son. There's Christ in his glory. There's, uh, there, there, there's the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. Beautiful way to see that passage of scripture. But some commentators, and I, and, I, and I go in this direction, I'm not discounting the, 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 the way that the ESV translates it, but I think there's something to be said here for, for the way that King James trans translates it. Peter is saying this, in days to come, you might not have experiences like that, but I want you to understand, you have a more sure word of prophecy. You have the word of God. And what Peter is telling us is this, we thank God for those times when the Spirit of God moves upon us, don't we? We thank God for those times when, when God seems so near. We thank God for those times when our heart is broken bef before him and he, and, he, and, he, and he patches us all back up. We thank God for these experiences. But the, but the Spirit-inspired Scripture is the light by which we walk in this dark world. Do you see what Peter says? So how do I walk in this dark world? By going from one experience to the other? No, I walk by the light of Scripture. You see, this is, this is, this is the, these are the effects of God-inspired Scripture. And so again, the doctrine of Holy Scripture, the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture is so important for us. Now I have to move quickly here because I know it's getting late. But let me say this. I want you to understand that this, this, this God-inspired Scripture, this Scripture given by way of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was the great motivating factor in all, in all of our Lord's conduct on this earth. And we see this especially as he comes to the end of his life. 
In his last few days on this earth, he almost purposely, it seems from, from the scripture, that he's doing everything in order to fulfill scripture. Listen to these passages of scripture. And we're all taken from Matthew. You don't have to turn there because we're, there's, there's probably about eight of them here. Matthew 26, verse 24. The Son of Man goeth as it was written of him. Matthew, 16, uh, Matthew 26, 31. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd. You will all be offended of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd. Matthew 26, verse 54. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Matthew 27, verse 9. This was fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Matthew excuse me, 27, verse 35. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Matthew 27, verse 30, uh, 46. And this is, this is a beautiful thing to see. The accusation against Christ as he hangs on the cross. Remember what I said before? They wouldn't let a good man die in peace. They, 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 they had to berate him. They had to mock him. They had to make sure that he heard all the verbal assaults. And what do they say in verse 43 of Matthew 27? He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. Since he said, I am the son of God. He trusted in God. How do they know he trusted in God? Because everything he did, he did by way of the scripture. The scripture was the pattern by which our Lord Jesus Christ lived. And after his death and resurrection, the scriptures become the perspective by which all of his work is to be understood. And again, and in fact, what we're going to see, and take your Bibles and turn to Luke 24. In fact, what we're going to see is we're going to see that the scripture not only becomes the perspective of how we are to understand the resurrection and our continuation in preaching the gospel, but he will, he will in one sense pre-authenticate what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. He will correct, he will reprove, he will instruct. Notice these passages of Scripture. Again, the, the idea now is our Lord is explaining his death, burial, and resurrection from the perspective of Scripture. Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. And then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures of things concerning himself. What did he do? You've heard me say this before. And I know it might sound kind of clumsy and it almost might sound fantastical when I say this. But I have a conviction that if Christ were here, he would open the scriptures and he would preach himself. He preached himself from the scriptures that day. Verse, 12, uh, verse 32 of, uh, of Luke 24. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he, while he talked with us in the way and while he opened the scriptures unto us? Oh, do you want these deep and moving experiences of God working upon the soul? Have the Spirit-inspired scriptures in front of you. And may God send to you a Spirit-led a spirit -led man to open the scriptures. As I said before, our Lord, in a sense, pre-authenticates what happens in 2 Timothy 3.16. Notice again here in verse 25 that he, how he reproves them. And he said unto them, these words, uh, uh, he, uh, again, uh, he said, O fool and slow to believe all that the scripture said. There's the reproof. Notice how he corrects them in verse uh, 26 and 27. Ought not Christ have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures of things concerning himself. He, he reproved, now he corrected. He instructs as well. Look here down in verses, uh, in verses 44 through uh, 49. And he said unto them, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that, in all, that all things must be fulfilled which were written of me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise again the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. There's instruction. And the last thing, I, not the last thing, but the last thing I want you to see from this passage of scripture is this. It's in his instruction that he teaches them that the spirit who inspired the scriptures will be the same spirit who empowers them to preach Christ from the scriptures. Notice again here in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in, in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The Spirit-inspired scriptures proclaimed by Spirit-empowered men. Thank God for this. And lastly, what I want you to see and understand, and forgive me for yelling at you this morning. I don't know why I yell when I'm saying this stuff. This is all, this is all very encouraging things, but I, I don't think I need to be yelling as I say it. But anyway, I, want you, I also want you to understand Again, that all of this is given for, you, for the benefit of your soul. 
It's given primarily to the glory of Jesus Christ, but it's also given to the benefit of your soul. Why do I say this? Let me just read this out here. Remember in, remember in closing that the Holy Scriptures originating in God, 2 Timothy 3, and inspired by the Holy Spirit and written through the instrumentality of men, Mark chapter 12, verse 36, to proclaim Christ, Luke 24, 49, are for Christ's glory and for your benefit. Why do I say this? Romans 4, 15, verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 4, 23 and 24, now it was not written for our sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us to whom it shall be imputed, this great gift of righteousness that God gives, if we believe on him that raised up our Lord from the dead. It was not written for his sake alone. You see, he's, uh, in, in the context, Paul is referring to the book of Genesis. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all of these things happened unto them for examples, and, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth has come. Well, my brothers and sisters, this is, this is the presentation and the effects of, of having God breathe scriptures in our possession. I hope you followed this. I hope you've seen this. I hope, if nothing else, you have a longing to let Jesus' view of Holy Scripture to be your own view of Holy Scripture. As I said before, it's, it's, it's a dividing line in a sense. You don't need to know much about a ministry or a man or a teaching other than what is his view of scripture? What's his view of inspiration? Does he, does he, at, least, does he at least attempt to have that view that Jesus had? No, oh, my friends, how can we as the followers of Jesus Christ have anything less than the same view that our Lord held? And may we be thankful that God has given to us the Spirit-inspired revelation given to us and preserved by His great grace in order that we might know the way of salvation. Well, let's pray. Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, make Your Word ever precious to us. Make us, Lord God, we pray, like that people who You say You have Your eye upon in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, that we, we might be the very ones who tremble in holy, reverent awe at Your Word. Grant these things, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.